Hey, welcome to week two of a series we're calling Rain. And uh, week one, we talked about sickness in our body, sickness in our nation, and sickness in our soul. And if you missed uh, week one of this series, I think it's really important uh, as an Action Church member. I think it's really important uh, as a Christian. I think it's really important in the country that we live in to go back and, and review last week's message. I really feel like it is very, very foundational for how we should filter uh, the current uh, circumstances in our world uh, and in our nation. We also talked about last week that we're gonna have a, a night tonight uh, of, of education and, and evolution. We're gonna start to begin talk about what is Action Church gonna do. And I want to make you rest to be at 7 p.m. tonight uh, at our Winter Park location only. 7 p.m., I said Sanford last week, but we really feel like after much talk and prayer, this is a family discussion, and so it'd be better if we're all in just one room. We're gonna have a panel up tonight and really just talk about some of the issues uh, of today regarding racism and how the church uh, can be uh, more empathetic, more educated, and evolve and make an even greater difference uh, in this area of our society. There'll be no child care this evening uh, at our Winter Park location. Uh, we will be streaming it. If you have children, you're not able to come. We'll be streaming on Facebook and on YouTube. And then we will do our best to social distance in this room, uh, but if there's more than, uh, than we can appropriately social distance, we will just fill this room. We will have a couple of extra rooms here. Uh, if you do not feel comfortable with that, that you're more than welcome, will be our action steps room, uh, and I believe our foyer and maybe even our kids theater, depending on the size, which will be social distance. So feel free, whatever uh, your comfort level, to come and join us in this room to watch with your family and friends at home. It'll be a great night of understanding and education and really talking about what Action Church is gonna do uh, in the future. Week two of rain. You know, I don't know if you know this, if you weren't here last week, but the, the kingdom of God is a kingdom, it's not a democracy. And in a kingdom, uh, opinions aren't as important, but authority is really important. Authority is the key to the kingdom. There is one person, there's one entity that is above all, and that is our King Jesus, that is our Lord and Savior, and that our God is all-powerful, and our job is to simply, as believers, surrender control, surrender our will, surrender everything to his will and his leading. We talked about last week the theme of the series, our vulnerability our vulnerability gives Jesus the ability to fight and to overcome everything that we struggle with. And Psalm 97 is our theme passage. It talks about the Lord reigning. Psalm 97, let's read it again. The Lord is king. Let the earth rejoice. Let the farthest coastlands be glad. Dark clouds surround him. Righteousness and justice are the foundation of his throne. Talked about that last week. That's so important right now in our society. It's not opinion, it's not politics, it's right living and justice. It's the foundation of God's kingdom. Fire spreads ahead of him and burns up all of his foes. His lightning flashes out across the world. The earth sees and trembles. The mountains melt like wax before the Lord, before the Lord of all the earth. The heavens proclaim his righteousness. Every nation sees his glory. Those who worship idols, talk about that today. Those who worship idols are disgraced. All who brag about their worthless gods, for every God must bow to him. Let's stop there. We're gonna talk about idols really falling down today. This series is based off of a song that we sang a few weeks ago on our weekly daily update with our good friend, Mac Brock. And uh, spoiler alert, Mac's actually gonna be here next week leading that song at all of our locations. And so... Make sure you get your tickets uh, really, really early. They're free, 7 p.m. on Monday nights. I'm pretty sure Winter Park and several locations will fill up. Max is gonna be leading that song. We have a powerful time in ministry closing out this series. But it says that sickness will bow, <clears throat> that idols fall down, and that darkness will run. Today we're gonna talk about the idols that are gonna be falling down in our life. To do that, I wanna go back to an Old Testament passage in Exodus chapter 32. Exodus 32, because we are not the first society to struggle with this idea of putting things above God. We're not the first society to elevate our needs and our opinions above the all-powerful God. It's amazing how the people of Israel really mirror and the church mirrors the people of Israel. We look back and we see them trusting God and then falling away, believing God and seeing the miraculous and then falling away. It's a human nature, it's a fallen nature, it's because we are sinful people. We find some correlation between our modern day church and the, the people of God. 
If you're not familiar with the story, let me just give you some brief context to what's happening in Exodus chapter 32. The people of God, the people of Israel, have been in captivity in Egypt, slaves for over 400 years, about 430 years. Well, God sets them free with the 10 plagues. Remember, he had the burning bush moment with Moses, and Moses goes and sets his people free, and then they're, they're, they're marching out, they're being led out, and then Pharaoh changes his mind, and he attacks them. And that's when the Red Sea happens, where God parts the Red Sea, and the people of God walk across, and then after they're all in safety, God destroys the Egyptian army and says, no, they're never gonna bother you again. It's these people, like this generation of people, like just a few uh, uh, seasons before this, they, they, these people had seen God rescue them from slavery. He had seen them, uh, seen God uh, save them through the Red Sea. Then we get to Exodus 20, and Moses has been going up and meeting with God consistently and gives him the Ten Commandments, and manna has been falling from heaven and, and nourishing them every single day. I'm just here to tell you, they've been seeing miracles. And if we're not careful, we'll look back with judgment over what happens in Exodus 32. And that's not the point today. The point today is we are the people of Israel in this story. We are the people that see God do the miraculous, that see God show up, that see God provide for us financially, that see God bring back our lost son or daughter, that see God break an addiction, that see God heal a marriage, that see God heal diseases. We see it and then, and then, we're like, wait a second, God's not good enough anymore, let me find a, a substitute. Here's what the people of Israel did in Exodus 32. Let's look at it, where they make the, the gold calf, they make an idol to God. Verse one of Exodus 32, when the people saw how long it was taking Moses to come back down the mountain, they gathered around Aaron. Aaron, we're just impatient people. Like, if, if God doesn't do it this week, we're like, God must not be interested in me anymore. Like, we, we get so distracted. We're like, squirrel. <laughs> just like, we're, we're God, God, and then we're just distracted. It took too long. So they gather and come on, they said, make us some gods who can lead us. Because we are spiritual beings, and, and we are looking for things to worship. That's what we're gonna talk about today. We, make us something to, to lead us. We don't know what happened to this fellow Moses. Yes, they do. He went to be with God so that he could lead them, but they forgot. It's amazing how we stop trusting God and the leadership that God has put in our life with just a little bit of space. We don't know what happened to this fellow who brought us here from the land of Egypt. So Aaron said, take the gold rings from the ears of your wives and sons and daughters and bring them to me. All the people took the gold rings from their ears and brought them to Aaron. Then Aaron took the gold, melted it down, and molded it into the shape of a calf. When the people saw it, they exclaimed, O oh, Israel, these are the gods who brought you out of the land of Egypt. Aaron saw how excited the people were, so he built an altar. Now we have a leader following the people, always a problem. So he built an altar. Announced tomorrow will be a festival to the Lord. Again, not the Lord, this is just the Lord, the, the golden calf. The people got up early. Notice, they're they are faithful in their, their worship of this idol. They've deserted their God, their, their true God, the one that saved them, and now they are extremely faithful and religious to even get up early, earlier than most of you got to church today. <laughs> Sacrifice, burnt offerings, and peace offerings. After this, they celebrated with feasting and drinking, and they indulged in pagan revelry. I don't know what that is, but it does not sound very godly. Pagan revelry. Somebody out there needs to hear that day. You need to stop rejoicing in pagan revelry. <laughs> Look it up and then stop it. Verse seven, the Lord told Moses, quick, go down to the mountain. Your people whom you brought from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. Get this, verse eight. How quickly they have turned away from the way I commanded them to live. How quickly we turn away. They have melted down gold and made a calf and they have bowed down and sacrificed to it. They are saying, these are your gods, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. They made this idol to worship because they, they, were, they were nervous, they were scared. Where did this man go? They, they didn't have a true trust in who God was, so they began to look for it in other things. I wrote this down this week. The world will always provide a counterfeit to fulfill the feeling that you and I are searching for. 
will always, you will always find it. We have, we have a real enemy, and he is really good at his job. And he will try and find something that you think fulfills the need that you feel, and it will be an idol, and it will feel good in the moment, but it will be the very thing that destroys you when you put your trust in something other than God. There are five idols. This is not just a golden calf deal. This is not an Old Testament deal. This is a, an American deal. This is an action church deal. This is a Christianity deal. There's five idols that I want to talk about today. Again, there's many more than this, but I found five, and I have a preacher's disease, so they all start with an S. Five idols that must fall for God to reign in our life. Write these five down, then we're going to go through them one by one. The first one, sports and entertainment. Uh-oh. I told you I'm getting all up in your business today. Here's one that'll surprise you, safety. The idol of safety. Number three, the idol of security. Number four, the idol of suffering. And number five, the idol of social justice. It's gonna be one of those messages today, buckle up. Sports and entertainment, write that down. See, I grew up in Alabama. And we don't really so much love the NFL in Alabama. We love some college football. The Trinity in Alabama is church, not God. The Trinity is church, Alabama, and Auburn. That is the Holy Trinity in Alabama. We love church because we love us some religion. And we have non-Christians that tithe in, in Alabama. That would be so bad. I, actually, Pastor Eddie, I would, I would like a couple people to tithe a little bit more, even not saved, you know what I mean? But we love the church, and we love Alabama football, and then if you're not good enough, you love Auburn football. I'm <laughs> just kidding, just kidding. But seriously, there's a big difference. So there's the, and we have this idol of, of sports. I mean, some of us don't even know what to do right now because it's not, we're having withdrawals from sports. Like, what am I gonna do with my life? I don't know if you know this, but there's more to life than just watching sports, and I've had to figure that out. But I've had to sacrifice the idol of sports over the past few months. But it's not just sports. Come on, Netflix. Some, some of you have Netflix, and by you, I mean me. Netflix, Hulu, Amazon Prime, YouTube TV, Disney Plus, ESPN Plus. We have access to the most distractions in the history of the world. And, and the things I'm listing today aren't sin in and of themselves. It's when we elevate them above God. And, and what I love about Pastor Eddie, our, our Winter Park location pastor, is Pastor Eddie will preach his quiet time to you every time you see him. Pastor, you will not believe what I read today. And it's like the first time he ever read the Bible every single time he talks about it. You know why? Because it's important to him. So here's the test. If you talk about more, more about what you're watching and what show you're watching and what you're binging more than you talk about what God is doing in your life, then... Like, can he talk to me like that? Yes, it's my job. And if you've logged into your social media or your streaming accounts, more, you've, more than you've logged into your you version the last week, you may figure out why you don't have peace and why you don't have favor and why you don't have this fulfillment because you're worshiping a golden calf. And it's fun. Hey, these people were having a blast. Drinking, partying, having fun, distracted from the, that's what idols do. Idols don't fulfill, idols distract. Here's the last one that comes to sports, kids sports. Oh, Jesus, help us. <laughs> Man, here's how you know. If you spend more money and time chasing your kids around than you do serving God. Oh, man. God, we talked about racism last week and kids sports today. This church, we're, gonna, we're actually only gonna be one location next week. I'm sorry. You know, stay-at-home parents or travel around the world parents don't raise go-to-church kids. And kids are leaving church more than ever but blaming the church is an old problem because back in the 80s and 90s, church had become older and traditional and didn't provide things like great kids ministry and great student ministry, and we could say the church doesn't get it. But it's not the church anymore. That's an outdated excuse. It's parents. They leave the church when they get older because they never knew it was a priority. Because we've worshiped at the idol of you're gonna be a success and you're gonna be great. And I'm not saying if you have a phenomenal 
young athlete that can use that for their testimony and their witness and, and build up character. I'm not saying it's bad my kids play sports. I'm saying when it supersedes their relationship with God, it becomes an idol. And just because it's accepted, all the people of Israel worshiping the calf, it was, oh, look at it. This is it. This is the thing. This is what we're doing. This is accepted. This is okay. Just because it's okay doesn't mean that it's godly. Just because opinions come around an idea doesn't mean it fits in the kingdom. And we have to allow this idol to fall down in our life. If our idols don't fall, catch this church, if our idols don't fall, we will. We will. One of them is falling. It's either the idol or it's us. Here's number two. We'll move on. The idol of safety. The idol of safety. We've never had a more real example of, of, of people worshiping at the idol of safety than this pandemic that we've been walking through. COVID-19, corona, whatever you want to call it. Christians have begun to worship at the idol of safety. I need to be very clear that I believe that COVID is real, that it is uncertain, it is scary, and it doesn't seem to be going anywhere. And we should be responsible. We should value safety. We should be wise, and we should take care of the vulnerable. But we can never bow at this idol. Have you noticed? I, we had so many Christians, Christians, criticizing Action Church when we were giving away a couple hundred thousand pounds of food. How can you be out there? How can you be helping people? How can you be going to hospitals and praying for people? How can you be going and, and writing? How can you be out right now? You should stay home. Do not serve. Do not go out. What are we talking about? Last time I checked, there's no Hebrews 11.2 where there's a hall of fame of fear and scared. I'm just saying that if the church is going to shrink back at every distraction and every, every sickness, and last time I checked, sickness will bow at the name of Jesus. Last time I checked, we have something that the world doesn't have. And so why are we as Christians shrinking back and saying, oh, we just need to be safe? Parents are like, don't go on that mission trip. Kids, don't go on a mission trip to that country. We need you to be safe. Hey, don't go to that area and tell people, like, Jesus, we need you to be safe. That's not in there. The disciples, 11 out of 12, martyred for the kingdom of God. They were not in their bubble. Safe, secure. I can just love God from my home. I can just be a Christian right here. No, you can't. The command we've been given is to go, yeah. not stay. That's right. Pastor, that's irresponsible. I'm not asking you to be irresponsible. In fact, I found this quote from Martin Luther. I don't know if you know this. We, we have a tendency to think we're the only people that have ever gone through something. Martin Luther wrote this going through the plague, which was a little more deadly than this pandemic. The mortality rate was significantly higher. And here's what he wrote. And I think it's so great, so timely for our church and for our Christian perspective. We've got to stop bowing at the idol of safety. He writes, others sit on this right hand. They are much too rash and reckless. Again, I'm not talking about being reckless. They're tempting God and disregarding everything which might counteract death and the plague. They disdain the use of medicines. They do not avoid the places and persons infected by the plague, but lightheartedly make sport of it and wish to prove how independent they are. That's not, that's not responsible. That's not wise. To say, oh, this isn't real, this doesn't affect me, God's gonna do what God's gonna do. No, he, he writes about this, it's so important. They say it is God's punishment. If he wants to protect them, he can do so without medicines or our carefulness. That is not trusting God, but tempting him. No, my dear friends, that is no good. Use medicine, take potions which can help you. Fumigate your house, yard, and street. Shun persons and places where your neighbor does not need your presence or has not recovered and act like a man who wants to help out this burning city. What else is this epidemic but a fire which instead of consuming wood and straw devours life and body? You ought to think this way very well. By God's decree, the enemy has sent us poison and death. 
Therefore, I shall ask God mercifully to protect us. That's why we talked about prayer this whole time. Then I shall fumigate. I shall help purify the air. I shall administer medicine and take it, which means I'm gonna help and receive. I shall avoid persons and places where my presence is not needed in order not to become contaminated and thus uh, infect and pollute others and so cause their death as a result of my negligence. If God should wish to take me, he will surely find me and I have done what he has expected of me and so I'm not responsible for either my own death or the death of others. This is so important. If my neighbor needs me, however, I shall not avoid place or person, but will go freely, as stated above. See, this is such God-fearing faith, because neither brash nor foolhearted, and does not tempt God. We need to be safe and responsible, but we have got to lay down this American ideal of safety if we're gonna be great commission people and go to the places that God is calling us to go. Here's what it says, this is scripture, not just Martin Luther, not just somebody we respect, this is God's word. Who could ever separate us from the endless love of God's anointed one? Absolutely no one. For nothing in the universe has the power to diminish his love toward us. Troubles, pressures, and problems are unable to come between us and heaven's love. What about persecutions? What about deprivations, dangers, and death threats? No, for they are all impotent to hinder his omnipotent love. Even though it is written all day long, we face death threats for your sake, God. We are considered to be nothing more than sheep to be slaughtered. Yet even in the midst of all of these things, we triumph over them all. For God has made us to be more than conquerors, and his demonstrated love is our glorious victory over everything. Yeah. Yeah. Here's the takeaway. I'm not saying not to be safe. I'm just asking us not to live scared. That I'm not gonna worship at this idol of safety. Here's the third one. It's the idol of security, the idol of security. Proverbs eleven twenty eight says, trust in your money and down you go. But the godly flourish like leaves in spring. We can't trust in our own security, which means we cannot trust in our own finances. We have to be good stewards, but we cannot have this idol of financial security. Do you know how many idols fell in these last Three months? How many stable businesses? I, I've got all that I need. I, I've set myself up, but nobody prepared for the world to shut down. So should we save? Yes. Should we give? Yes. Should we store away and prepare for a rainy day? Absolutely. But if you've built this thing of your security, of your financial stability, or what you can earn, I'm just here to tell you, you're going to be disappointed. Because first of all, it's never gonna fulfill you. And second of all, it's not guaranteed no matter how smart you are. That's, right. That's, right. that's one of the great things from a Christian perspective that's come from this pandemic is that we've realized that we do not have control over what we thought we had control of. And it's why these, these idols have so much control because they begin to distract us. Because if I can binge watch Netflix, I don't have to think about what's going on in my life. If I stay safe right where I am, I don't have to worry about anybody else. And it's, it's an idol. It's a mirage. We do it with the security of relationships. Because we say things like this. Here's, here's how you know. If I just had this amount of money or this house, then I would be fulfilled. That's an idol because only God can fulfill you. But we do it with relationships as well. If I just had a spouse, come on, single people, you're like, man, if I just... Where are the single small groups at Action Church? Is there a pop-up for singles? I wanna start a pop-up for singles. In fact, that's a great idea. In fact, if you're single in here, start a pop-up. Start a small group. Get on the team. I'm just here to tell you, but it's not gonna solve all your problems. Because the idols are great from a distance, but you get up really close and you realize this golden calf is just a bunch of people's junk that they didn't want anymore. Like, I gotta, I gotta get me... I gotta get me a spouse, and I love my wife, and we just celebrated 14 years, but I'm here to tell you a spouse is not gonna solve all your problems. It may create a few. 
Maybe you're married here. I'm worshiping at the idol of, of relationships. I gotta have a kid. If I just had a kid, it would be great. And that the first day and that gender reveal, so special. You hit the baseball, you kick the soccer ball, the balloon pops. Oh my gosh, this feels so much better. I love you. All of our marriage problems are gone until week one and nobody has slept and nobody has eaten. And you look and think that idol has just fallen. This kid is not perfect. He's from the devil. We have idols of great families. Uh oh. I'm telling you, idols aren't in themselves bad. There's nothing wrong with these gold rings. It's what they do with it. Some of you are worshiping your family. I got great parents and we do everything together and we don't really, we don't really do anything else but work and then hang out together. And it's just us and family's my first ministry. It's your first ministry, but it ain't your only ministry. And some of you create an idol out of this security. We create idols out of pastors and leaders and small group leaders and I expect them to provide all of these things. Oh, idols must fall or we will. Here's the fourth one, the idol of suffering. The idol of suffering. These last two are gonna sound a little counterintuitive and I, and I thought about after last week, not going here in the last two, but then I just thought, we have to. Because some of you are worshiping at the idol of suffering. John 16, we quoted it in our last series. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart or take courage. I, Jesus, has overcome the world. In this world, you will have trouble, so there will be suffering. But then it says, you gotta catch this, take courage. So how am I gonna get through these obstacles? How am I gonna get through this pandemic? How am I gonna get through this oppression? How am I gonna get through this injustice? And here's how we think we do it. And too many of you are doing this right now, whether it be pandemic or racism or whatever. You say, how am I gonna do it? I'm gonna take my pain. I'm gonna take what somebody said. I'm gonna take what society says. I'm gonna take this victim mentality and God says in this world I, I, have, I will have trouble but I'm gonna overcome it and I take my pain and I take my victimhood and that's not what the word says. It says in this world you will face trouble but it says take courage, take heart, take the things that the word of God says. Don't take your past with you. Jesus died for it. Allow him to redeem it, learn from it. But if we take all of that with us, we will never be able to see God overcome our situations. Not minimize. You say, Pastor, you don't understand what it's like to be me. You're right. You don't understand what I went through. You're right. But Jesus does. It says we have a high priest that understands everything we went through. And either you believe the Bible or you don't. And so if you carry that victim mentality and you carry that pain, then somewhere along the way you forgot who Jesus was and who Jesus is in your life. Take courage. Last one is the idol of social justice. And I need you to know at Action Church, if you weren't here last week, you need to listen to, we, we're gonna fight for people. That's our job. But we said last week we can never let a worldly mission supersede the great commission that God has put us on. Mark 8, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? That's not just financial. What if we won every worldly battle we were fighting against? What if there was no more hunger? What if there was no more abortion? And what if there was no more racism where everybody was treated equally, but the people still didn't know Jesus? We'd have a better world and a more full hell for eternity. So am I saying stop helping people? No, I'm saying don't ever let it become the main thing. That social justice is a great medium, is a great avenue, is a great conduit to a eternal change, but it should never be the stopping point. We're gonna fight for people. We're gonna fight for justice. We're gonna fight for equality. We're gonna fight for understanding. We're gonna fight for change, but all with the goal so that people find Jesus. 
Let's go back to the verse we read last week. We'll close here. Let's go to Matthew 22. Idols only fall when we surrender them to Jesus. Matthew 22, teacher, this is the Pharisees and the Sadducees trying to get Jesus. Teacher, which is the most important commandment in the law of Moses? And this is where we're getting right now. I love all of you, but your direct messages and your emails trying to get us to continue to pick a side. Well, what about this? You cannot solve one argument by arguing a different one. You can stop sending them or find a different church. I'm tired of it. I'm tired of Christians not solving real problems just because we wanna bring up a different one. You're a Pharisee and a Sadducee and Jesus calls you out right here. I'm tired of it. It's not how we solve things by, by, by mentioning and highlighting other things. What if we just solved all of them? One at a time. Gosh. Sorry, a little human moment, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, I'm tired of the divisiveness of Christians. I get it from the world. I don't get it from Christians. I don't, I don't get it how you became God and started valuing other lives over more and your cause over different cause just because it fits in your political party and your paradigm that's more important than somebody else. I'm tired of it. <laughs> Teacher, which is the most important? They wanted him to say something specific. They wanted him to, to pick a platform. Jesus replied, you must love the Lord, your God, with all of your heart, all of your soul, and all of your mind, and idols get in the way of all. Because when we put something else beside him, that is no longer all of our heart. So when somebody else in a relationship, even a healthy relationship, takes the place of all of our heart where we get all of our worth and all of our security and all of our fulfillment from somebody else, we've created an idol out of that person. All of your mind, that means when, when a worldly perspective, when a cause, when something that feels good when we do it, when it takes the place of, of our mind being focused on God, when our soul, when our focus and our paradigm, it's all. This is the first and greatest commandment. A second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. And then verse 40. We don't get to verse 40 a lot. It says the entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. Which means to me, I'm just simple. It means everything should be filtered through these two commandments. And until we get these two, we don't need to go much further. Pastor, what about this? Hey, have you, have you decided to love the Lord your God with all of your heart and all of your soul and all of your mind? You haven't got that one yet? Okay, we'll start there. Where, where we lose you. Hey, have you decided to love your neighbor as you love yourself? No? Well, let's not worry about the next one. Let's not move on past one and two until we get them as a church. So that's where we're gonna go. We're gonna allow God to reign in our church, to reign in our families, to reign in our life because idols are gonna fall down. Again, all five of these we mentioned are, all, are mentioned are all great as long as they don't supersede God. And then we're gonna go on a journey of loving people well. And that won't be tomorrow and that won't be next week. And I just gotta say it one more time, we can't talk about every issue every time we talk. Stop. Every post, every sermon, every conversation, we cannot talk about all the problems in the world. We'd be here for eternity. Let's just pick one at a time and attack it, pray through it, love through it. And as we begin to take on one after the other, I believe we can see some real change. And hey, catch this, this is why I love having a church of thousands of people. Because my cause may not be your cause. Our command is the same, but what if you got off the sidelines and started fighting for the things that you're yelling about so much? We'll resource all of it. You wanna fight against hunger? Done. We're gonna fight against racism and abortion because I think they're the two biggest 
tragedies in our day and time. I think that's what our country will be held accountable for. But you find something else, education, let's go. Resourcing undereducated and homeless, I'm all in. Let's quit yelling about it. Let's be about it and start to do something. Loving our neighbor. I'm over time and off my soapbox now. Let's bow our heads at all of our locations. Every head bowed, every eye closed. God, we love you. God, I thank you for your word. God, I thank you for encouraging words. And God, I thank you for correcting words. I thank you so much for how this series and this sermon has affected my paradigm in my life, that there's some things that need to fall down in my life personally. And I know in our church, there are things that we need to surrender to you. So I pray that we do that today. Holy Spirit, across all of our locations, that you would begin to speak to us in a real way. Challenge us, change us where we need to be changed. Church, every head bowed, every eye closed. I wanna give you an opportunity today to surrender the idol of control. Because this selfishness, this pride is what's keeping you elevating other things. What if you laid that down today and accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior? Some of you have never worshiped the one true living God. I wanna give you that opportunity today. That Jesus lived a perfect life, died a sinner's death in your place to give you forgiveness. He rose again to give you victory. And I wonder if you gave him your life today and saw everything change. Your perspective, your paradigm, your eternal destination. You are one heartfelt prayer, one step, one decision from starting a relationship with Jesus. What if you did that today at all of our locations? Nobody's looking around, just you and your heavenly Father. You say, God, I need you today. I'm accepting Jesus for the first time or maybe for the first time in a long time by recommitting your life today. Would you raise your hands? I know who's praying with me right now. Come on, you need Jesus. I'm, I'm laying down the idols. I'm laying down my own security. I'm laying down safety. I am giving my life to Jesus today. Thank you. Come on, proud of you. Couple in the stadium, yeah. Come on, Sanford, South Orlando. Anybody watching in a home right now? I need Jesus to be Lord of my life. Put your hands down, pray this in your heart as I pray out loud. Say to say, God, I love you. And God, I thank you for saving me. I acknowledge that I'm a sinner and I'm saved only by your grace. And I'm confessing with my mouth and I'm believing in my heart that you are the Lord and I'm giving you that place today, complete and total control. God, have your way in my life. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Now, God, I pray for all of us. I pray that we would love you this week with all of our mind, all of our heart, all of our soul. God, I pray that across all areas, not picking and choosing what's convenient, not picking and choosing what we're passionate about, but we would begin to love our neighbor. Loving you, loving people, and fighting for change. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Church, can we celebrate all the decisions? Come on, celebrate them.